we're looking at uh, King Solomon, the son of David, uh, as he has uh, had the given orders to and seen to the temple being built. And he's standing before the people um, in the temple court in front of the uh, bronze uh, altar uh, there. And he's uh, speaking and, and praying to the Lord. And it's a, a long prayer. And so we're looking at different aspects of this this prayer and how they speak to us today as Jesus, the son of David, uh, also takes care of us, cares for us. And as Jesus spoke in Luke 24, all of scripture speaks of him. So we look at how this speaks of Jesus, how this speaks to our lives uh, today. So we begin in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, beginning in verse 33. This is God's word eternally true. This is Solomon praying to the Lord. When your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and confess your name, praying and making supplication to you in this temple, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land you gave their fathers. Now look forward to verse 46. Uh, uh, Solomon comes back to this theme and expands on it a little bit more. Verse 46 of the same chapter. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to the enemy, who takes them captive to his own land, far away or near, and if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive, and repent, and plead with you in the land of their conquerors, and say, We have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you towards this land, the land God gave their fathers, toward the city that, is cho- that you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. And forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offenses they have committed against you and cause their conquerors to show them mercy. For they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out of Egypt, out of that iron smelting furnace. Here ends our reading. There's in your bulletin a response of of thankfulness. Uh, that we give for God, giving us His Word. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Solomon deals with uh, future potential discipline of God's people, um, which really, as we'll see, is future potential nonsense for you who are fans of The Office. Um, FPN. Uh, as uh, Jim abbreviates it, uh, uh, Dwight. Uh, but uh, he, God uh, steers us away from this through this passage. Uh, Solomon has declared this time that God had declared through Moses, and Moses had declared to the people that there would come a time when the people would, because of their sin, bring God to anger and a foreign nation would conquer them. And they would be exiled. And indeed, the book of Kings is written to those exiles, uh, those who have been conquered in battle. So as they're reading this, they're like, that's us. Uh, They had been conquered. They had been carried away, taken as captives, and they were living in in Babylon. And so that's where we read Daniel is when we read the book of Daniel. He's one of these who have been carried off into, into captivity. And so... Uh, we read that they're now in a state of being excluded from the promised land. We think of our own lives, and sometimes we have been excluded from things, or sometimes we get excluded from things, whether it's a project at work that you wanted to serve on or be a part of, or uh, whether it's you were on an athletic team and you didn't get included in something, or you didn't make the starting lineup, or didn't make the, didn't make the team altogether. It's not a fun place to be when you're not 
it's not a fun place to be when you're not included in something, um, when you're left out, uh, when you're away from where you want to be. And that's what this passage uh, speaks to, uh, in particular, uh, of being in or out of the promised land. So if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you're welcome to, you're welcome to do that. If you want to just listen, that's fine too. But we see here in our introduction as we deal with what, what does it mean to be left out of the church or what does it, be, it mean to be left out of the kingdom of God and what's involved in that, uh, we say this, A, in your introduction there, a church person can wind up out of the church, out of the church for a few reasons. One, that can be, so moving on down there, you'll see it's a big outline, but we'll move through it quickly as we go through this morning. One, it can be by their own will. Uh, by their own will, for various reasons, they no longer attend worship. They're no longer a part of the church. Or two, a person may be out of the church because they've been removed from the, rem the membership role by the church's elders, um, because the elders have become convinced through the person's behavior or non-response or non-participation in the church that they're not a believer and that they were inappropriately were included in the first place on the, on the membership role of the church. And so that's called excommunication. That's the, the blank you have there. So a person can be out of the church, either by their own will, just not being there, by their own volition, or they can be out of the church because they've been declared a non-believer and they don't want to be there anyway, but they're, in a real official sense, uh, out of the church. Now, as we've talked about before, be in your outline there, the church today is the promised land for the believer. So if you think about the promised land in Old Testament times, the promised land was the place you could be where everybody was um, signed up to the fact that the God of the Bible was God and all other gods were false. And so when you're in the promised land, there was really no official dispute about that. And so when we translate that forward and when we, when we see how the New Testament talks about the church, we see that the church is this promised land today for those who are living in the body today on the earth. When we come into this place, there's no dispute that there is a God. There's no dispute that this God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we, we can put our guard down because we're, we are at home. We're in the promised land. We're in the land where God is worshipped in spirit and in truth. Just like God's spirit was there in the temple and people understood by the law of Moses the truth of God's word. And so today, the church is the promised, the church is the promised land on earth. C. So when one is outside the church, he is, like the first recipients of 1 Kings, in exile and outside the promised land. So if we want an equivalent for the exiles of Old Testament times today, we're talking about people who used to be in the church, whether it was when they were a kid or, or as an adult, but they're no longer in the church. Um, and whether that's by their own volition or, or something else, they're outside the church today. So we're not exactly talking about non-believers who have never been in the church. We're not talking about Buddhists in Thailand or anything like that. We're talking about people who have been in the church and are now not in the church. And we're saying this is, they're the equivalent here of being people who are outside the promised land who once used to be. So this sermon is really for two groups. Um, first, those described in A above, um, those who are outside the church. And we might ask, what's the point of that, preaching to those who aren't here? <laughs> One is they may just wind up through Facebook here and, and listening. Um, that, that, that could be. Um, the other two is, is that um, uh, maybe this will give you some... Um, some reasoning or some truth points to talk to. We all know people who used to be in the church who aren't in the church anymore. And so in this passage, we'll hear reasons to be in the church and how one can be in the church again. And so that's why, that's why uh, we, we preach this, 
uh, to you. Um, so it'll, uh, the, but secondly, the message here is for, for you um, who are here, and it's for you to save you from trouble and chaos, to shape, save you from uh, trouble and chaos. So that's the second group, you who are here. So number one, number one is God speaks to us this morning. First note that God disciplines his people. God disciplines his people. Um, now sometimes we think of discipline, most of the time we think of discipline as a bad thing. But it's not a bad thing if you think of, of, of training in various aspects. That's all discipline. Or if you're talking about disciplining your mind toward a certain thing. Or disciplining your body toward a certain thing, like, like uh, in, in athletics. Or, uh, you know, whatever the case would be. A certain discipline that you take, a procedure that you have at work. Or, or discipline like the military does in their training. So that you respond in particular ways in particular situations. We had an associate pastor in Bloomington, Indiana, who was a, a Marine, and on his 18th birthday, he walked into the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. <laughs> that was his 18th birthday gift, um, or 19th birthday gift. And, and he talked, talked about how they were trained that when you went into a house, uh, that the first thing you did was you got upstairs first. Because if you fought people downstairs, you know, there could be people coming down the stairs and they could just, you know, wipe you out while you weren't paying attention. So you fought your way upstairs and then worked your way back down, down in. But he talked about he was the only, I think he was the only member of his um, division um, to, to get out of the Tet Offensive alive. But there was certain training, certain discipline that came to him that was for his own good, uh, that he was uh, uh, well to pay attention to, well to pay attention to. Um, but God declares to us, uh, we heard from Bob as he read in Hebrews 12, uh, God disciplines his children. And, and if God didn't care for you, he wouldn't give you discipline. And he wouldn't discipline you. And if when you were a kid, your dad spanked you, your mom spanked you, or whatever it was, or for those of you who are younger, you didn't get spanked because we all know that's abuse and older people don't know how to behave today because spanking was bad. Um, that's all tongue-in-cheek. Um, uh, that uh, discipline was for your good. And maybe some of you actually had the dad that said, you know, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Uh, and if you've been a parent, you know, you know, how, that, you know how that is. But God disciplines his people, um, A, there in your outline, 1A, because he's a father who loves his children. That's Hebrews 12. If you're not being disciplined, if you're just walking out in wild sinfulness and it's all working out for you, that's not a good sign. That means maybe God doesn't care about you. He's just let you walk, letting you walk into it and destroy your life. Instead of bringing in certain things that cause you to pause and stop and, and, and uh, you know, go home and rethink your life, right? Boy, that phrase is so good. But the one good thing I got out of episode two in and, and, and the Star Wars um, series there. Um, but yeah, the, the, um, God disciplines his people. And look here in this passage, verse 33 and verse, verse, 33 and verse 46. Um, why do they get defeated by their enemies? Why do they wind up in a foreign land captive? It's because of their sin. And God is disciplining them. And he had told them that would be the case. Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. Through Moses he had given the curses and the blessings of the covenant. And God promised them as part of the covenant. This is, part of the, this is not God abandoning the covenant. This is God fulfilling the covenant when his people are disobedient and he sends them profit and withholds rain from them and gives them all these warnings and they still don't heed it. The worst of all covenant curses with it was that you would be defeated by your enemies and you would be taken captive to a foreign land. This is God disciplining. This is God disciplining his people. He, as verse 46 says, gives them over. He gives them over to their enemy. God quits fighting for them. And he lets them just be taken over uh, uh, to 
uh, their foreign enemies. Um, God disciplines his people. This is Luke 15. You know, we have the prodigal son there. God gave that son over. All the wealth that he had from his father, God let that all slip through his fingers so that he got to the point where nothing was going right and he had to hire himself out to a foreigner and take the lowest of all jobs, feeding pigs. And being so hungry, he wished he could eat the pig food without someone seeing him because he was so hungry. That was God's discipline on this unfaithful son, the son who was no longer in the promised land, but out among the Gentiles and, and living, living in sin. No longer a faithful covenant community member, a true Israelite living like an Israelite. And so God gives him over and disciplines him. So uh, be there. Why does God do this? Why does God do discipline? Why does he say he's going to do discipline to his people in Leviticus 26? It's so that the people will turn back to him. So he can bless them again. It's to train them in right living, right? That's one of the reasons, purposes of God's word, 2 Timothy 3.16. To train you in righteousness. Why? Because God wants to kill your joy? No, because God wants your joy to be full. That's why Jesus said he came. You know, the thief, Jesus, the, the, the thief, Satan comes to kill and rob and destroy, but I came that they might have life, that you might have life and might have it abundantly so that our joy would be full. And our joy is full as we walk in God's ways. And so God spends, arranges sovereign, sovereignly arranges events in our life when we get off course so that we come back in and live in such a way that we experience his blessings and experience joy. So God brings discipline in our life, not because he doesn't like us anymore, if we're his. He brings discipline in our life because he loves us and he sees what we're doing and the consequences that are coming to us. And he brings those things as warnings to our life so that we say, like this prodigal son, what am I doing here? Even my father's servants have it better than I have. So he does this to bring his children back. Uh, should any, there, your second blank, to bring his children back into the church, should any of us leave? And this is, the, this is the idea we see in verse 34 and verse 46. God doesn't abandon his people forever into exile. But Solomon says, you know, when, when they realize all this and come back to you and pray, return them to the land. And that's God's objective and discipline to return us to faithfulness for our sakes and for his glory. So number two, number two, God says to the person who's out of the church, you're welcome to return. God says to the person who's out of the church, used to be in, now is out. You're welcome to return. You're welcome to return to the church we see this again, verse 34 and 46. This is God's objective, that God's people would come back, that God would return them, that God would cause uh, their captors to show them mercy and allow them to come back. And we know historically this was true with the exiles in the Old Testament. We, we read of it in Daniel, uh, the Babylonians who were the captors of, of Israel um, are overtaken by the Persians and the new Persian king Cyrus, also known by the name Darius, um, releases the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem. He even gives them money and cattle and supplies so they can rebuild the temple. And he sends them away with his, with his blessing so they come back into the promised land. That's how Jesus winds up being born in the promised land. He, his forefathers had been off in exile, but they had been back for uh, 500 years. So uh, God does this um, to the person who's out of the church, says you're welcome to come back. And certainly we see this in the, the story of the prodigal son, don't we? The prodigal son is worried about whether he'll be received. But we have that great verse, but while he was still a long way off, 
his father sees him and comes and runs to him. It's not a reluctant reception. Someone's out of the church today, and they come back in. It's not a reluctant reception by God, nor should it be from us who are in the church. It's brother, sister, welcome back. We're so glad. Let's celebrate. And for those of you who know that parable, the older brother gets rebuked because he's not celebrating. He's not welcoming back, welcoming back his brother into the, the community of God. And so this is God communicating through Solomon, God communicating through Jesus in the parable of the prodigal son. This is how God deals with people who are out of the church and come back. He's happy. Kill the fatted calf. Get my best robe, put a ring on his finger. His son was dead to me. And he was dead to the family, not by my choice, but by his but now he's decided to be my son again. Never that he wasn't. He always was, had my DNA. But now he's realized the wisdom of being my son. It's better to be a son in my house, even while I'm alive and he's not controlling everything. It's much better to be my son in the house than it is to be a servant out somewhere. The son even realizes this, right? It's better just to be a servant in my father's house because this is my father's character. He treats his servants well. And so that's how we think about our loved ones who have been out of the church. We don't say, well, if you buck up and you do this list of things, maybe we'll let you back in. It's like, no, just come. Everybody will be glad. Heaven will rejoice. And so will we that you've come back. So God says to the person who's out of the church, you're welcome to come back in. Second line there for you. The hardship uh, God disciplines his his errant children with is designed to bring them back. So there you have Leviticus 26, 18. God reviews different little covenant curses he's going to bring to his people should they walk away from him. And he says, and if this one doesn't work, then I'll bring this one on them. And you see right there in this verse, Those covenant curses like no rain or whatever it was, were supposed to bring people back. That was the expectation of God sending that discipline, that they would would come back. So the hardship God gives people, and people when they're outside the church, they endure hardships. Things don't go well for them. And they may admit that, or they may say, "Mm, no, I'm doing okay. But they're not doing okay. They're not being honest with themselves. God's bringing, if they're his children, he's bringing disciplines upon them in varying degrees, different things upon them, and their little red flags that he's bringing to them, saying, hey, come on back. It's better. and It's even better just to be a servant. But when you come back, you'll not just be a servant, you'll be my son. And I'll throw a party for you. So the hardship God disciplines his errant children with is designed to bring them to bring them back. So no, if you're ever outside the church, if you're ever outside the church, God calls you back in. He always does. You're, you're, you're probably not doing worse than this prodigal son was doing. You're, you're almost certainly not doing worse than the exiles that were being written in this book. Why were they exiled? It wasn't for... Uh, I, it's my new favorite word, peccadillos. It sounds like armadillo. It means a small sin. <laughs> you're, you're not being exiled because of this, uh, uh, you know, the, oh, I hate that guy, or this guy really bugs me, or, or withholding some favor somebody, or a lustful eye here. You're not being exiled. You're not out of the church or experiencing discipline for that. What they were experiencing discipline for, why they got exiled, was they were worshiping other gods in the promised land. They had idols inside the temple and were worshiping those idols, those other gods inside the temple, which was built for God's name. So probably nothing you're going to do is that equivalent. Right? You're probably not going to build an idol, bring it into this church, and convince other people to worship this other god with you. That's the equivalent, right? So don't think if you ever find yourself outside the church that you're worse than what God has seen before. 
and that you're some exception to the clause. Here's Old Testament Israel and they're the height of their sin, and here's the worst you can do. <laughs> really, honestly, that's probably about it. Uh, so you're, you're, you're welcome to come back in and welcome. Number three, number three. It's because of Jesus' death. It's because of Jesus' death by Jesus' meditation that God is loving and compassionate. It's because of Jesus' death by his mediation on the cross that God is loving and compassionate to the one who returns to the church. It's because of Jesus' mediation that God is compassionate and loving to one who returns to the church. Um, this is the, uh, the disposition of the father and the prodigal son story, right? He's not given any proof of a, a change of heart by his son. He just sees his son, and he's just always waiting for his son to, to come back. But, but why, why do we say this? It's because of Jesus' death. There's mediation that God can be loving and compassionate. Uh, just, just note here in this passage, what do the people do to return? Um, they look to the temple there. When they pray, they pray and they look to the temple. What was the temple? We've talked about this in the past couple of weeks. The temple was the place where mediation was done. Right? The, the, the God's wrath against their sin was, was extinguished in the temple through animal sacrifices. And so when someone looked from their exile back toward the temple and prayed like Daniel would do three times a day, right? He would turn toward Jerusalem, toward the temple, and pray. It was this acknowledgement that I need the mediation that God provides for me for Him to hear my prayers and for Him to return me to the promised land. And that's what we do even when we're praying in Jesus' name. We're turning toward the temple, aren't we? Because John 2, what's that? I always forget that verse, 221. Jesus says, I'm the temple. I'm the temple that you can destroy and be, uh, it'll be built back up in three days. Because John, the writer of the gospel, says, because Jesus was talking about his body. Jesus is the temple. He's the presence of God on earth among his people. Jesus, not the temple now, is the great mediator for anyone who wants to come back into the church. So Jesus is the temple, and his sacrificial death, here's your word, extinguishes. His sacrificial death extinguishes God's anger, extinguishes God's anger against a person's sins. Verse 46, we read you know, that, that, that God's anger was raised so much that he let enemies come in and and the, people, and the people were exiled. But Ephesians 5, 6, Colossians 3, 6, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. Look in, look in your Bibles to your declaration of the gospel. Or sorry, look at the, your bulletin to the declaration of the gospel. Front page there. Second thing. Ephesians 5, 6, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. Um, and this is to assure you as... Uh, my Old Testament, one of my Old Testament professors would say, see, it's not just an Old Testament thing. We think sometimes that God's only wrathful in the Old Testament. But here's the New Testament writing about God's wrath. So you see there, Ephesians 5, 6, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Colossians 3, 6, which isn't there for you, says the wrath of God is coming. And then 1 Thessalonians 9 and 10, you turn to God to serve the living and true God to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues you from the coming wrath. Jesus is the mediator. He's the reason we are rescued from God's wrath that we have earned by our sins, just like these people in the Old Testament times, they had earned God's wrath. They had earned defeat by their enemies. They had earned exile. They had earned not being included in the promised land. But as they consider again the temple and the mercy of God expressed to them in the temple and they turn back to the temple and pray, God hears their prayers and returns them to the land. 
and, and that's the case for somebody uh, today. They can be received back in the ch- into the church. How can God do this? Because Jesus has done this mediation. He has been the temple and all its sacrifices for those who come for those who come to Him. So be in your outline there. Uh, be in the outline uh, as the person prays toward the temple. Verses 34 and 38, give that mention there. That is toward Jesus, that's your blank. As the person prays toward the temple or toward Jesus, who is the temple, God hears, God hears his prayers as he's outside the church. As he looks back and prays toward Jesus. God hears his prayers and his plea to return. Uh, This is Solomon's prayer here, verse 34, 48, and 49, that God's people were to to pray and to plea with God, and that God would hear. And then see, God causes the person's enemies to release him. That's verse 50. Look at verse 50 there. Part of God's response to this prayer, because this mediation has been done, this prayer through the temple has been done, that their, their enemies, their captors, show them mercy and let them return to the promised land. And so, see in your outline there, God causes the person's enemies, if he's outside the church, he used to be in, but he's outside the church, and a person looks back toward Jesus and, and prays, God causes that person's enemies, who are these? Here's, and it's in the parenthesis for you. What's the enemy of the person who's outside the church? It's his sin nature and Satan. And Satan wants to oppress that person who's left the church. He wants to oppress him for longer, to do more to him, to cause more negative consequences. Satan's not the friend of the person who leaves the church. Satan's like, all right, now you're on my side. I'll treat you well. I'll treat you better than God does. No, Satan gets a person out of the church, and he continues to deceive him. He says, keep following me, and it'll be better for you. And he keeps bringing negative consequences, hardship destruction on the person's life, but he continues to deceive. And so what God does as the person turns back is he pushes back Satan, and he pushes back that person's sin nature so that person can say, you know what, I'm going to let my pride aside. That's my sin nature speaking. I can't go back to the church, that'll be too embarrassing. That's pride, that's the sin nature speaking. And God says to that person who cries out to him, He pushes back that person's sin nature. He says to Satan, leave him, like Satan did to the demon-possessed people. Leave him. Release him. You've had him in your captivity. Your time is over. Let him go. And that person can come back. That's why people come back into the church, because this has gone, because this has gone on. So when someone sins, there's all kinds of oppression. And God brings that uh, to an end, um, brings that to an end. You know, it's not fun out there. Like my grandfather used to say to my dad, you know, he'd say to my dad, Carl, it's not easy out there. It's a hard, it's a cold, hard world out there. You can have friends and when things are going well, they're laughing with you and that kind of thing. But like Betsy and I read the other night in, in Proverbs, you know, a friend is made for adversity. A true friend is there with you when you're going through adversity. And that true friend for us is Jesus. And those true friends for us are the people of God. They're the ones who walk with us through adversity. They're the ones who love and care for us through adversity. When things aren't going well, they come to us more greatly. And they're sad that they haven't spent more time beforehand to help you beforehand so that it's so difficult for you now. But these are our true friends. This is why, why Jesus said, don't worry if your, your mom and your dad and your brother and sisters abandon you for your faith in me. Because you'll be rewarded with more brothers and more sisters within the kingdom of God. You'll, be up, you'll have people who are more loyal, more helpful to you um, here in the church. And then D, lastly and importantly, Um, the mediation of Jesus brings about this. God then forgives. 
God then forgives the person's sins and upholds his cause. And what's his cause? It doesn't mean my cause is getting a Ferrari. It's not what it's talking about. We stay in context here. What's the cause? The cause is for the person who's found himself outside the church. The cause is, can I re-enter? And that's it. The cause of re-entering the church as a member. Because of the mediation of Jesus, his death on the cross, which extinguished God's wrath against all that person's sins, God forgives the sins. He upholds the cause. Verse 4, that's 50 is forgives. Verse 49, and he upholds the cause, and God returns you to the church. Verse 34. Um, Acts 10.43 says this, All the prophets testify about Jesus that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness through his name. So when we turn to Jesus as our mediator, as the temple, as all the sacrifice we'll ever need for our sin, um, it, they receive forgiveness of sins through his name and brings them back into the promised land we had Bob read that one odd verse for us in Hebrews 12 after the passage about discipline and God disciplining you because you're a son and he loves you. Then we skip down to verse 22 and, and the writer of Hebrews says this, don't worry about going to Jerusalem again. He's writing to, to Jewish Christians in Rome and they were wondering whether they should just become Jewish again. It would avoid a bunch of persecution and so they were wondering if they should just become Jew Jew Jewish again and not Christian and head back to Jerusalem. And the writer of Hebrews says, no, God has brought you to the, Jerus to the Jerusalem above, to the heavenly Jerusalem, where the angels are, where those who have died in faith, human beings who have died in faith before you are, to the joyful assembly surrounding the firstborn Jesus. He's brought you by your faith in Jesus back to the promised land. That was the real goal of the exiles. Boy, to see Jerusalem again. Will that ever happen? Will I see it? Even Nehemiah years later is longing to see Jerusalem and he's distraught that he hears Jerusalem is still, still in shambles. But God has told us in the gospel we've been brought to the heavenly Jerusalem. We've been brought back. We've entered into God's kingdom in that way. So just to review, the benefits, um, some of the benefits for those who are in God's church are expressed in, A, the anger against the God's person's sins are extinguished by Jesus' death. Uh, B, God hears the prayers to return into the church. C, that person's oppressors of Satan and his own sin nature are put at bay. And he gets released to return, to come back in. And then D, that person's sins, God forgives him and receives him back into the church. So related to this, number four, here's how one can return to the church. Here's how one can return to the church. A, these are all contained in Solomon's prayer. A, cooperate with the Holy Spirit and have a change of heart. Solomon mentions this in verse 47. Here's what needs to happen for us to be returned from our exile. We need to experience a change, a change of heart. This is the prodigal son in Luke 15, 17, who I love the phrase, Jeremiah uses it as well. He comes to his senses. He says, what have I done? Where am I? Look at, look at what's become of me. He has a change of heart about how he views his father and how he views life out there in the world. He formerly thought life out there in the world was all fun, and my dad was just a drag. And now he has this change of heart, and he says, my dad is where it's at. People are blessed to be around him. I was blessed to be his son. No one out here has treated me as well as my dad ever did. So there's a change of heart, but that requires God's spirit. You know, Titus 3.5, he saves us by the washing and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He gives us this change of heart. He changes our perspective. So there's a cooperation involved. When God begins working on you, and you think, man, I should head back. Um, listen. Right? Hebrews, 12, Hebrews verse 4. Today, if you hear his voice, 
listen and enter back into the promised land. Don't stay out there in the wilderness. Today, if you hear his voice, respond to that uh, pulling of the Holy Spirit. Number two, or B, turn back to God. Turn back to God with all your heart and soul. So this is, this is what somebody does who's outside the church. He needs to turn back to God with his heart and soul. And so we see this language of turning back to God in verse 34. And then verse 48. We see it as well with the prodigal son in verse 21. He puts his feet to where his change of heart have led him. He goes back to his father. He goes back. He turns back to his father. See. What's involved for a person who's been out of the church to come back in? They need to confess God's name. To confess God's name. And what does that mean? It means to declare it. That's in your parentheses there. To declare it or redeclare God to be your God. Now, if you're receiving this book, First Kings, you're in exile and God had not been your God for some time. Maybe generationally. He had not been your God. He was not your father's God. He was not your grandfather's God. They were not doing well in the years before exile. There were idols all over the place, and that's why they got exiled. And so God, so Solomon sees that here. And he says, and if your people confess your name, not Baal's name, not Molech's name, not one of the Chemosh, not one of the other gods in the nations, which had been in Israel, and people were worshiping God, these gods, at high places all around Israel. And so this involves... Conf Psalmist says, confessing your name. You're our God. You're the one we get everything from. You're the one who blesses us. You know, Baal was the rain God. And people believed if I worship Baal, he'll send rain on my crops. That's why Baal was a, a temptation for God's people. Um, that's why in the Psalms, God says, I ride the clouds. I send the rain. I throw the lightning bolts. That was what Baal was seen as. And God says, no, Baal doesn't do that. I, I do that. So turn to me. Okay, so confess his name. Redeclare him to be your, uh, re -declare him to be your God. Um, just like this uh, prodigal son says, no, I belong with my father. Either as a servant or as his son. D. D. Uh, it involves this person repenting. Repenting, confessing to God his sins, his wrong heart, uh, wrong actions, and the wickedness of those. We see that in verse 47 there. Uh, repent, if, uh, if we're out in exile and we repent, confessing to you our sins, our wrongdoings, uh, and, and the wickedness thereof, um, then God receives them back. And again, prodigal son, out in, the, out in his uh, 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 dismal state. Um, he says, Father, he, he plans his speech, the thing he's going to say to his dad when he sees his dad, uh, I, I've sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. This is, this is real repentance. He says, here's what's true, Dad. I've taken half your inheritance, half of what you earned, and I just blew it in a short amount of time, and now I'm asking for your favor. I'm not worthy to be your son. Can I just can I come and be one of your, your servants and just earn a wage? I don't even deserve that, but please, that's repentance. When we recognize who we are and, and, and what our deeds deserve. And so Solomon says that needs to be part of things when we want to come back into the promised land. That we say, God, we don't deserve to be taken back to the promised land again to have you bless us with large crops and, and fruit of the womb and fruit of the field and, and defeating our enemies all the time like we did under David and Solomon. Repentance. E, here's how a person can come back into the church. Plead with God in prayer. So you don't just sneak in and hope that God doesn't see them. <laughs> they go directly to God and they plead with God in prayer to bring them back into the church. And so you see this language of pleading and praying in verse 49, verse 34, verse 48. And indeed, this is, this is, what, the, uh, this is what the prodigal son does as well. He goes and he, he pleads with his father, please accept me as a servant back in, in your realm, on your farm, on your, on your estate. 
And then F, it involves something very important for us to see. Understand, understand it. Get back into the promised land. Understand that hearing, God's hearing you and returning you to the church will not be based, not be based on your own merit. Again, the prodigal son doesn't say, you should receive me back because I was a pretty good son before I left. And I, I had some bad breaks when I was out there. Um, and covering up the fact that he had blown half the inheritance, uh, but rather he's just basing, he's not basing things on, on his own merit of why he should be received back. He's basing it on the fact that his father made a choice to have a son. Um, where do we see that in this passage? Um, well, we see it in verse uh, 51. We see it in verse 51. Um, Let me open up to turn to that again. Um, and this is Solomon's understanding of why God will return them. Here's the reason. Verse 51. For, you, for they are your people. They're your inheritance. You brought them out of Egypt. We read in Deuteronomy 7. 7 Deuteronomy 7. I'll list it for you there. Bob read this for us. God said, I didn't choose you because you were the largest of the nations or the most fabulous or the most skilled. In fact, you're one of the smallest of the nations. I chose you for the sake of your fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And even there it was grace. The reason you have something to expect anything from me is because I made a sovereign choice that had nothing to do with your merit, simply to be kind to you. We make that decision when we marry somebody. I am making a decision for the rest of my life to be kind to you. And so Solomon brings that up here. Why should you return us back? Because we prayed, because we pleaded, because all these various things. No, the basis of it is we're your people and that was your decision. You said you would ultimately not abandon us. And so we just plead your being faithful to your promise. And so in your outline here, that's this. Number one, what do we base this on? Being let back into the church, the Father's election. That's the Father's promise before He created anything, Ephesians 1.4, to show His love toward particular people who did not deserve it. And so the person who's out of the church should say, you know what? I didn't deserve to be in the church in the first place. I was there by your grace. I was there because you elected me. I was there because, not because I was the, the greatest of people, Deuteronomy 7. I was the least of the people, and you chose me to show off your grace. And so, Father, I guess time to do it again. Show off your grace. Be faithful to your promise to be faithful to me even though I don't deserve to be called your son. Okay, so that's the basis, the father's election of, of, of the person who's been outside the church. Also, number two, as we talked about before, the temples or Jesus' mediation for him. Jesus is the temple, Jesus' mediation from the cross. How can I receive forgiveness? By doing all these things right, praying and pleading and repenting. No, it's, it's, it's the, the mediation. What makes it possible? It's that my sins have been extinguished on the cross 2,000 years ago. Not because I followed the steps. I should follow the steps, but that's not why I can get back in. Okay, and then thirdly, to be fully Trinitarian here, the Spirit's giving him a change of heart. Why should a person expect to be let back in? Because the Spirit has been working and gave him a change of heart, like that prodigal son, where he, he came to his senses and said, what am I doing outside here? This is awful. I'm, I'm thinking about eating pig's food. My father's servants are feasting. So the Spirit brings that about. Um, so now number, So that's how a person comes back in. They turn back to God. They say, God, you're my God. I know I put you aside, but now 
You're my God. And they repent and they confess their sins. E, they, they plead with God in prayer to bring them back into the church. And they understand as they come back in, this is not because they're a good person again. It's because they were never a good person. And God has simply chosen them to show off His grace and mercy and, and fantastic uh, ability to be kind to people that should not be treated with kindness. But number five, for you... Not for someone who's out the ch- outside the church. How do they get back in? For anyone who happens to be listening on Facebook or, or for you as you talk to people who are outside the church. But now you sitting here, as you sit in, that's your blank there, as you sit in the church, avoid the fuss. Just avoid the fuss. See this. You, know, you can be exiled. You can go outside the church. You can, you can lose all the good stuff that you had while you were here. But why? Just avoid the fuss. You know, that's just, that's the pleading of this passage. And as Solomon prayed this in the temple, that was the message to his, you know, to his congregation there, the Israelites. You know what? We could be exiled by, by leaving God, by our sin rising to the level where God's so angry he, he kicks us out of the country. But, but Why? Why do we want to go through all that? Um, yesterday we were talking, we had a Presbyterian meeting, and, and we were talking about Jim and I were sitting next to each other. I was sitting next to both Jim, so it was, that was fun yesterday. As I, intro- as I introduced them, I said, Hi, this is Jim and my other brother Jim. <laughs> For fans of New Heart. Um, uh, but, but uh, um, yeah, there's one person who was proposing we're... Uh, for, Giving, uh, talking about something where we were saying, you know, we should really lock the door so that this never enters into the church. Just turn the deadbolt. So this sin never enters into the church. And just declare, we're not for that sin. And, and, and if you want to be an elder or a deacon here or a, a pastor here, we're just, we're just going to declare, you know, that can't be part of your life. That sin can't be part of your life um, for you to be an officer in the church. You can come in and be a member and hear the gospel and we hope you come to be saved and then walk away from that sin. Sure, but let's just lock the door. But, but one of the arguments, which I obviously you'll hear here, I didn't agree with, it was the person said essentially, um, I don't see anyone out in my front yard that's kind of muddy and soaked right now who wants to come in and steal stuff. So let's not make the, let's not you know, turn the deadbolt. Let's leave the door open. And, and if somebody comes in and they get mud all over my carpet and steal my stuff and break the table and, and knock over a chair while they're in here stealing my stuff, well, we'll try to find them. And, and then we'll, we'll get the police to go after them and hopefully the police won't get damaged as they're, you know, the, as they're apprehending this guy. And then we'll put them up and feed them some meals while he's waiting for his court date to occur. Then we'll get a lawyer and, you know, and we'll go through all this hubbub and finally, we'll convict him of his crime, and it'll still be worse than if it never happened. And so this is a passage that just says, hey, just turn the deadbolt. Don't have your carpet ruined with mud that you do yourself. Don't have your you know, glass coffee table broken. Don't have your TV stolen and your jewelry taken. Uh, just... Don't enter into that in the first place. So your number five there, for you as you sit in the church, avoid the fuss of future chaos, hardship, and the whole process of returning by continuing to do, of returning. And, and how do you do that? Just continue to do the following. As you're sitting in the church, just continue on confessing God. So that's your A. Confess God always as your God. Letting him direct your life. That was a problem with you know, the people shortly after the days of Solomon. Even Solomon in his later life. He, did, he confessed other gods. And he had wives that were confessing other gods. And he wasn't allowing God to direct his life. God specifically said, no, she needs to be a covenant person if she's to be your wife. And she should only be one in number. And Solomon heads off in another direction and causes all kinds of chaos in his life. And the kingdom splits because he doesn't continue to confess God as his God and follow him and allow God to direct him 
in all his in all his life. And so Colossians 1.18 says that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. In everything, he is to have the supremacy. And so just continue to allow Jesus to have the supremacy in your life. Allow him to be the head of everything you're doing and saying in your attitude. Allow him to correct you. Allow him to rebuke you through his word. Allow him to train you in righteousness and right living. So that you can just stay in the promised land and enjoy it. So you can just stay in the church instead of all the chaos of being outside the church and having your family broken up or whatever consequences come to you. Number two, or B, pray to him about all things. Don't just have your prayer be when you're in chaos and you're like the prodigal son and you've hit your rock bottom and pray to him. Do that if you're there. But just while you're in the church, just pray to him about all things. That's first, you know, first Thessalonians 5.18 there. Um, that word of prayer, uh, sorry, that, uh, I mean Philippians 4, 6 says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Always be praying to Him. Always be looking to Him for your needs. Even your daily bread. You know, my knee kind of hurts today. God, can you heal this as I sleep tonight? Um, I felt my body was Felt, felt terrible last night. I woke up this morning. I prayed that last night. And I feel really good today. It's like, thank you. Thank you, God. You actually did that during, you know, and so pray to him about all kinds of stuff, important stuff and less important stuff, like how you feel today. Um, to see, by God's spirit, have your heart be ever responsive, ever responsive, and ever repentant toward Jesus. Have your heart be always and ever responsive and ever repentant toward Jesus as he calls you to action in various ways through his word. Just have your heart your heart set and your mindset to be, you know, if, if I'm reading God's word and it convicts me about the way I'm treating somebody or what I'm doing, stop and turn. Just change. Be, be responsive to that. Um, and, and, and don't, don't, bury that and then bury it again when God brings it up to you in a louder way and then bury it again when God brings up to you in a louder way just be responsive um, to that and and repent then and there Um, allow God's words to guide your actions D um, be devoted and as a person as a life mindset um, be devoted to God without interruption be devoted to God without interruption, with all your heart and soul. And verse 48 mentions this, that God's people are to turn back to them, turn back to him with all their heart and soul. And Jesus says this is important. Moses said it first, but Jesus says it too. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. That's your Mark 12, 30 passage there. But have that be without interruption. Don't take a vacation from God at any point because that could, that could go bad quickly and, and your heart could turn during that. And then you find yourself on down the line four years from then in a bad place. So just be devoted to God without interruption, with all your heart and all your soul. Don't just go through the motions. Have your heart and soul be involved in it. And then E, when thinking about your presence in the church and your presence with God in the age to come, Always be grateful. Always be grateful. Uh, that's our attitude about being in the church. And as you're in the church, just be, be grateful to be included. That's our attitude in the church. I can be here. I can be considered a citizen of heaven, a, a brother, a sister to, to these people here. One who hears God's word uh, uh, um, spoken of in a positive way that helps my life. Um, So be grateful for God's placing you in the church. Be grateful that he'll place you in the new heaven and new earth. Be grateful he'll place your soul in heaven when you die. And know that it's by this. Here's why you're grateful and not proud about being in the church. And as you're in the church, don't be proud about it. Be grateful. And why are you grateful? Again, the Trinity, right? The Father elected you. Be grateful. Father, you elected me. It had nothing to do with my marriage. Um, Jesus died for you. 
Jesus, you knew what a, a terrible sinner I would be, and you came to the earth and you bore my sins in your body on the cross before I had sinned a single sin. And you did that for me. I didn't do that for myself. And by that mediation, I can be in the church. So I'm grateful to you, Jesus. And then be grateful because you recognize that you didn't bring about your own change of heart that brought you to your initial faith. But that was the work of God's Spirit. Again, as, as Jesus said in John 3, unless one is born from above, not unless you give yourself birth, but unless one is born from above or born of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or Titus 3, 5. Where, how are we saved? Not by our own deeds of good works, uh, but we're, we're saved by the washing and renewing, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And so be grateful that the Father who elected you sent Jesus to bear your sins and die for your sins, and then both of them sent His Spirit to regenerate your heart, to change your heart, so you'd come to Him in the first place. And so realize as you're in the church here, this is not a thing about you. This is a, you're a trophy of God's grace. You're evidence that God elects, that God dies for His people, and that God rejuvenates His people to life. That's why you're here. So summary, summary. The church has great benefits. The church has great benefits. All who leave lose them for as long as they're outside the church. They just abandon them. It's like, you know, you can go to your mailbox at the end of your driveway. I wish I had a mailbox at the end of my driveway. We've got a mail room that we have to go to. I'm still kind of rebellious against that. I don't go every day because <laughs> I'm not going in this room, this COVID infested room. <laughs> That's like if you had a mailbox at the end of your driveway and God overnight just put a $1,000 bill. If there are $1,000 bills, I don't know. He put a $1,000 bill in your mailbox every, every night during the night. But if you didn't pick it up by noon, it would be gone. Just, you know, just go pick up the bill. You know, go in there. But if, if you leave your house, you never get to pick up those $1,000 bills. Right? It's just every day days goes by. Instead of the, the end of a week, you have $7,000. At the end of the week, you have nothing, and you have the scars on your body to show beyond you having nothing, you're hurting. So all who leave the church lose all these benefits until they come back. And then, next line, there's always a way back into the church. There's always a way back into the church. But... It's much simpler just to stay in. Uh, uh, God didn't phrase it this way. This is me. Just don't be a knucklehead. <laughs> right? It's just simpler to stay in. Just stay in. Confessing God all the time. Praying to Him about all things. Recognizing Him as your provider. Be ever repentant and ever responsive to His Word. And be, great, be devoted without interruption to Him. And be grateful that He's brought you here. And just stay. It's good here. Let's pray.